Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Ruth Leftwich. I'm the Director of Learning at the Senator John Hines History Center. We thank you so much for joining us this evening for what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic program highlighting the work of Tim Meniz and connecting that to the current exhibition that we have on display at the History Center, Smithsonian's Portraits of Pittsburgh. A few things just to orient you to our space this evening. Uh, we are in a Zoom webinar format. If you have any issues, you can reach the panelists. That includes me if you need some tech help um, using the chat feature down at the bottom of your screen. That will go to all panelists this evening. There will be plenty of opportunity for questions and answers. And we encourage you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for that feature. So you can type any questions you have in there as we go through the program. And we'll use that as dedicated time at the end of the program to be able to answer the questions that you have for Tim around his work and his career. We appreciate the opportunity tonight to provide our closed captioning, thanks to funding from the Edith L. Trees Charitable Trust. If you would like to access that, click on the closed captioning button, the CC down at the bottom of your screen, and that will be provided live for you this evening. We also love the opportunity to feature our own collections when we do programs. Uh, and this evening's program is gonna be a great opportunity for us to really consider the way that a History Center collection connects with uh, the national collection that we have on display at the History Center tonight. So I'm going to welcome our curator, Leslie Savillic, who is the curator for the exhibition and will do an introduction and then hand it over to get our program started. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, thanks, Mary Ruth. And thank you to all of you. We're so pleased to see so many people here this evening. I'm gonna take a moment here to share my screen. And, you know, this is a topic that we have been talking about doing since we started planning programs for this exhibition. Caricature is such a great topic anyway, and the exhibition itself has about 10 to 11 caricatures as part of what is on display from the portrait gallery. That ranges from um, examples like the one you see on the left of the screen here, Joe Montana, that was done by Jack Davis for Time Magazine. If it looks vaguely familiar, he was one of the artists who was really a founder of Mad Magazine. So if you are of a certain generation, you may have spent many enjoyable hours reading through Mad and looking at the caricatures there. And another kind of caricature that actually is, is probably the bulk of what is in the National Portrait Gallery is exemplified by the work on the right. This is George S. Kaufman, and then with two actors from one of his plays. This is by Ralph Barton. He is one of a number of artists who kind of created the feel of the 1920s and the 1930s in celebrity caricatures. Now, in our exhibition, a number of the caricatures that we've included are things that look at kind of political commentary, social commentary. I think that the person who is the most well represented both in our exhibition. He's the only person who has two images in there as caricatures. That is here you see him, Mr. Andrew Carnegie. But caricature is a great reminder for us that portraits, that these images and likenesses can be time specific. As you'll look on these two images, they are both from the early 1900s, this is after Carnegie had switched from being this industrial magnet to being in effect a philanthropist. And caricature over time can give us a sense of what kind of traits multiple artists zoom in on, uh, what is used to portray this person, themes that have dominated the way he's been portrayed in the media over time. Carnegie is a great example of that. And another one who appears in our exhibit in multiple ways and is really an illustration of why we felt that we really wanted to do a program on caricature is this example of Andrew Mellon. You know, I know when people think of the portrait gallery, they tend to think of images such as the formal portrait of Andrew Mellon. This was done when he was serving on a diplomatic mission to England. It is a typical portrait designed to portray him in a certain manner. Contrast that with the image on the far right. This is kind of a caricature editorial illustration of him 
after a change in administrations, and he's now kind of the subject of multiple legal suits, but caricature and cartooning, and, and I'll say a few words about the interplay between those two in a moment. For us, it really helps us remind people that portraiture is not an objective art form. It's determined by the relationship of the subject and the sitter, by who commissioned a work, by the purpose behind the work. What is it being used for? You see, I also included here in the middle um, a cartoon. It's an editorial cartoon. And if you look to the left of that, you can see Andrew Mellon. This is from 1926, when actually he's being celebrated as one of the secrets of American success. 1926, you have three years to go before the stock market crash. And this cartoon is a great reminder that the way someone is perceived or portrayed can change based on a very specific set of events. You'll note tonight in the conversation that it will merge the idea of caricature and the idea of cartooning. I thought it might be helpful to say just a couple words about that. Because of the nature of our portrait gallery exhibition, we're focusing on caricature as the jumping off point because caricature is based and extends out of a likeness. There's a real person involved. Cartooning doesn't need to involve a real person. It can be um, other issues, other ideas. The caricature and the cartoon with the way they'll talk about them in the program tonight, you're gonna see it move back and forth, but they're really kind of pieces of the same thing, but caricature is the one that extends out of something that is related to a real person. And I think the other thing that's really useful for you to consider as we move into the main event this evening is that caricature is a really old art form. It actually dates back to Italy. Scholars really sort of regard the earliest examples of caricature to be in the 1600s. And it comes from the Italian word caricare, that is to load or charge. So think of it as a loaded or a charged portrait. And some of the earliest examples have to do with men and drawing their faces to kind of connect with the resemblance of different kinds of animals. So he looks like he has the beak of a hawk or he's sly like a fox. It also connected to this idea of the study of physiognomy, which was this belief now largely discredited that you can look at the structure of someone's head and face and determine their characteristics. Um, caricature made its way to the rest of Europe and for us most specifically to Great Britain by the 1700s and then of course came to the United States. And it really is fitting that it's part of our exhibition at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery because early on it was also a part of the English National Portrait Gallery. And in fact, Great Britain was the home of a number of really well-known caricaturists, people like William Hogarth, and in this case, James Gilray. This is just one example of an earlier 1700s um, caricature, the giant factotum amusing himself. It has to do with William Pitt the Younger in Parliament. He is crushing his opponents, but I think it gives you a really good feel for the 18th century version of what caricature was. Just know that what we're talking about today has a long history. As Mary Ruth said, our exhibition does also give us a chance to kind of look a little bit at items in our collection. You'll see much more about this in a moment related to the library and archives, but we do have a piece of Tim Minnie's work that is on display as part of the portrait gallery exhibition. It's in the final gallery. It is the mayoral hot seat, a chair with a caricature of Tom Murphy on it. And I must say it is a staff favorite. And it really is a great segue to kind of shifting this program to our main content of the night, but I couldn't help but include at the end here, you know, I showed you some earlier example, examples of Andrew Carnegie. Some people, it's just too good to leave them in the past. Here's a much more recent depiction of Andrew Carnegie. Now it's avant-garde Andy from 2008, one of Tim Minnie's own covers from Pittsburgh Quarterly. And that's really a good segue for me to introduce um, another staff member here. We, we are fortunate to have Tim Minnie's with us this evening, but we're also fortunate to have our own staff member, Sierra Green. She's an archivist in the Detry Library and Archives. Some of you may have worked with Sierra before. She does a marvelous job with programming for student and adult groups. I'd like to now introduce Sierra. I'm gonna stop my screen share here.
and segue the, the program to Sierra. And she is going to introduce Tim and carry on the conversation for this evening. So take it away, Sierra. Thank you so much, Leslie. Wonderful. So I'm going to um, share my screen here. And before we invite Tim on the virtual stage, we're going to spend some time just um, learning from his collection of original caricatures and cartoons that he donated to us at the Heinz History Center. So Tim donated his archives to us in 2017. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, um, Tim was an editorial cartoonist for nearly 30 years with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Um, and thankfully for us, he was a wonderful record keeper. So in all, he donated nine boxes and primarily those boxes are filled with thousands of his cartoons that he created throughout his career at the PG as well as at the Pittsburgh Quarterly. Um, now, in addition, this collection also contains original clippings of various articles and other pieces that he wrote over the years, as well as a couple folders of really jauntily and hilariously interspersed hate and fan mail that he, um, that he collected. Now, as we were reviewing this collection of um, amazing materials documenting Tim's career, one of the things that really jumped out to us at the History Center was the local focus that he took. Um, from the early 70s when he came to Pittsburgh and joined the staff of the PG throughout his career, it was, um, it's very clear that he found such creative fertile ground in the happenings of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania. That was so exciting for us because it overlaps powerfully with our mission as an organization, as a museum. We are focused in sharing and telling and preserving Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania history and the story of the people who have contributed to these narratives over time. So there's a wonderful amount of overlap between the work that Tim did and covering um, Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania as an editorial cartoonist and the work that we do as a museum in telling Western Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh stories. So I want to share just some of the themes that emerged in some of his local um, cartoons that were published in the Post-Gazette. Um, and this is actually really some of the core work that we do as archivists is really spend time with the raw materials of history. In this case, Tim's cartoons that he created day after day, year after year, decade after decade and tucked away. Um, and connecting them to bigger topics and themes in Pittsburgh, in Western Pennsylvania, in national and international history. Um, so as I was reviewing these cartoons, again, some of these themes organically emerged and they matched beautifully with some of the conversations that we had with Tim preliminarily before this program. So I selected this particular cartoon to open things up because it really hits on um, a number of the eccentricities in Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania story that Tim so, um, so um, assiduously um, observed you know, throughout his time. So he centers this fictional couple who is on a tour of Pittsburgh in the 80s from Russia. Um, and he has them hilariously conflating first Three River Stadium for a place of worship because of all the thousands of people that descended upon um, that part of the city every Sunday. Um, more somberly, he also has them um, looking at um, the steel mills and them as places of um, of inactivity and places um, you know that um, you know that are no longer serving their their preliminary purpose. He has them conflated as as a place of museum. Um, he also takes a couple shots at um, the checkered past and various efforts to revitalize Liberty Avenue and the various businesses um, that have defined it at certain parts in our history as a city. Um, in addition to uh, we see the rickety uh, light rail um, system back and forth from the South Hills also, um, you know, getting lampooned to an extent in this cartoon. And then what consistently emerges as a favorite target of Tim's um, is also depicted in, in this cartoon, and that's the state store system, which this fictional Russian couple Tim has um, comparing fondly to various stores in Eastern Europe that are more that they're more accustomed to in their experience. So again, um, I love this as a segue to highlight just some of the themes that emerge in Tim's Western Pennsylvania cartoons. Um, 
So it's clear from the 1970s that um, the city and the county offer for Tim an incredible cast of political characters from which he can um, really draw some fantastic storylines. Um, so as Leslie mentioned towards the end of her presentation, we have Mira Murphy depicted creatively by Tim within our portraits exhibit. And Mira Murphy is a character that um, comes onto the scene and, and reappears often throughout his tenure as mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, I, opt, I think of him as um, a character that's coming in and out of a show that he is often very frantically, but in a very heartfelt way, often engaged in pretty like harebrained schemes, schemes to try to um, just resuscitate the city of Pittsburgh and to in particular to um, liberate it from its financial woes that it experienced um, throughout the course of his um, his time as mayor. So Tim really creatively manifests some of these um, burdens that are on Mayor Murphy's shoulders at the time in pieces of paper that are flying off of his mayoral desk. And we have the mayor standing um, on top his desk in a state of real um, um, uh, in a state of, of um, real like direness, um, really turning to a totem of which all of us as Western Pennsylvanians are very familiar. And that is of course, none other than the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I will say that Amir Murphy is just one of many political characters that were on the scene throughout the course of Tim's career that he draws upon. And we'll definitely get into that within the conversation piece of our time together. So also, um, there are a collection of really wonderful cartoons um, and that include characters, caricatures of just the classic Yinzer experience as I, um, I, as I define it um, within this presentation. And um, this, this one um, in particular, Tim takes the opportunity of the All-Star Game for MLB taking place in Pittsburgh in 1994 um, as a chance to really get at multiples of those in one fail swoop. So we have in this um, cartoon an individual um, Pittsburgher who's um, graciously um, providing some insights uh, from a local perspective to visitors. So um, in this cartoon, we have this person saying, you know what, don't look, don't, don't look for alcohol in the local grocery store. Make sure to tap those brakes like a local once you get towards the any of the tunnels. Um, definitely be super cautious as you um, approach any crosswalks as a pedestrian. And we see that message double down in the background of this cartoon um, where we have a Pittsburgh driver gleefully taking out a pedestrian who had the audacity to use a crosswalk appropriately. Um, also, too, you know, you, you see some barbs at um, the language inclinations of us as, as Pittsburgh residents. Um, and then, of course, our inability to provide like universally understandable street directions. So it's just a really, really great piece. Um, you know, when I came across these cartoons, um, it was just a really joyful experience for me as a Western Pennsylvania native. And I often had that feeling that I did, um, that I can remember very distinctly the first time I got a caricature done of myself. It was at an amusement park, I was a teenager, and I can just remember really needing to fight that inclination to kind of peek around the side of the easel and see the caricature as it was taking shape. Um, and. I often found in those moments, I was so eager to come across another cartoon um, that really resonated with, again, those eccentricities about what it is to be a Pittsburgher or to be a Western Pennsylvanian, um, that Tim's real comprehensive identity as an editorial cartoonist came to light. There were a collect. There are a collection of cartoons um, that really powerfully speak to societal issues that um, face us historically and that have powerful reverberations to the present. This is just one of those examples. So in this instance, um, Tim makes use of the annual convention of the NAACP taking place in the city of Pittsburgh in 1997 to harken back to the killing of Johnny Gamage at the hands of police officers that took place just a few years earlier in 1995. And again, what really struck me so often with these cartoons that seriously and very earnestly engaged with societal issues was just the extent to which so many of them really contain powerful resonance in the present moment and will do so for the future. 
Um, as an archivist, when I look at, at um, Tim's collection of cartoons, I feel with such confidence that researchers are going to see really powerful intersections with issues that, um, that are, are perpetual research um, interest in, and can help us build understanding um, historically and contemporarily. Now, as you'd imagine, thinking about Tim's career starting in the 70s and then going through to the present day, um, he's on the scene and really witnesses Pittsburgh as it's undergoing um, ident its identity crisis. And there's a real change in um, personality traits and character traits of the city as it relates to industry in particular. So a number of his cartoons really directly address the collapse of the steel industry. In this case, we have Santa Claus in a sleigh who's perched atop um, abandoned um, smokestacks from a local steel mill and just checking and confirming that, um, that they are long abandoned. Now we also see two cartoons of his that get to um, the type of industries that will redefine and, and contemporarily define our city and our region. And that of course includes medicine, it includes um, the emergence of the tech industry in our region, and also to um, the, the prominence of higher ed as a facet of, of Pittsburgh's contemporary industry. This is one of my favorites and um, it centers a CMU lunar robot who um, Tim has hilariously navigating the um, pothole laden streets of Pittsburgh as a wonderful simulation for what an experience would be like to explore outer space for this poor lunar robot. So it's kind of a double whammy in that it gets at like um, our, our unfortunate um, road, you know, the situation of the state of our roads, but it also, you know, speaks to these bigger themes within Pittsburgh history of um, you know, just different industries defining our region over time. Now, of course, no 30 year career um, covering the city of Pittsburgh from the vantage point of an edit editorial cartoonist would be complete without a collection, a robust collection of cartoons that cover the local sports scene. I have to say it was excruciating just to select one that gives a glimpse into the nature of Tim's coverage of sports uh, locally, but I settled on this one, which harkens to a much darker time for Steelers fans, and it has um, a fan on his knees in his living room, um, falling down that slippery slope of bargaining with God to keep a backup quarterback, none other than Charlie Batch, um, safe and healthy in light of the fact that at the time Ben Roethlisberger was really struggling with an injury issue. Um, so it's just a wonderful piece and um, again, you know, speaks to um, Tim's tapping into the city's um, identity over time. So with that, I would love to formally welcome Tim Menees onto the virtual stage. Um, he deserves a formal introduction and that is what I'm going to give him here. So Tim Menees grew up in and near Seattle after college in the Air Force, he wrote for the Seattle PI, then drew political cartoons for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette for 30 years. His cartoons appeared in national newspapers and news magazines, cartoon anthologies, and on network TV. He also wrote and illustrated a weekly column and feature stories on a 24-hour visit inside a state penitentiary, a week aboard a Great Lakes freighter, and the arts behind bars. He drew syndicated comic strips, and among, his state, and, and among his fans was Susan Ford, who gave a drawing to her dad, the president. The Pittsburgh New Works Festival staged his children's play and gave another a seated reading. The first stage theater in Los Angeles put, put on one of his 10 minute plays. In 2010, one of his paintings was part of the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh show at the Carnegie Museum of Art. His work is represented by a gallery in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, Canada. He has taught creative writing at Western Penn and has played piano and accordion in three different groups. Four of his short stories have recently run in online literary journals and House Tour was published in the Evening Street Review. At present, his cartoons appear in the Pittsburgh Quarterly as has his writing. His nonfiction also appears in Boomer Cafe. So I wanna welcome Tim Menees. And I also, for the audience, just wanna encourage you all, if you have questions that arise throughout the evening, please put them in the Q&A feature um, and we will get to them throughout the course of the program. So welcome, Tim. Um, so I have an opening question for you. Um, and 
that's really kind of getting at your roots and your, your the roots of your connection to Pittsburgh. So you came to Pittsburgh, of course, as an outsider in the 1970s. Um, can you take us back to, to that time early in your career and thinking about encountering the city, what leapt out to you as a young editorial cartoonist about our region? It was so different from Seattle where I grew up and, and after the Air Force, uh, I worked as a reporter and a columnist for four years. I mean, it was the, just the history itself. And uh, like Seattle, it's very hilly, but there's mm -hmm. much more. It was, a, I could see that there was, it had been through the ringer with, uh, with and it's not yet steel, but with uh, uh, a sort of a national criticism of the smoky skies and whatnot. But it just struck me that that um, that it was so different in terms of respect for the family and the neighborhoods and um, mm. long families with long, long people whose generate generations have lived in Pittsburgh uh, and um, there is a real sense of pride. There's a sense of they've had they they got knocked around a lot. And there's a sort of a a sense of not inferiority complex, but they've just been clobbered upside the head, as they say. And I think that's what made the Steelers such a force here is that finally, by God, somebody's going to go out and, and, you know, and show them who's who. And um, so that that is the sense I got of the city, that it was had a great pride in what it had been. You know, Seattle was up there in the corner of the country, and then Oh, they had Boeing, yeah, they had Boeing, but I mean, the city, Pittsburgh considered itself kind of one of the builders of America, and certainly during the war, and, and uh, that, you know, so that, that was uh, kind of an overarching thought I had, and then, then, and of course, as you've shown, um, you got the, the trolleys that rattle along, and, and the state store system, and, and the potholes, and all that, and it was, you know, it was, um, it was a different culture, it was, it was an older city, not, older physically, but, but uh, you know, in Seattle, the mayor was young. I mean, there's a, there's a different feel here. You know, people have been in politics for a long time, you know, and, and so it, it, all these things are going on. And, and it, I think uh, when you come in as a, an outsider, you, you, you pick up on little nuances or big nuances, actually, you know, and, um, and so it was, um, it was a real godsend for me that I came here and I felt that I, that the city needed me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's what... it didn't need me at all, but you know, here I am. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Um, it's actually, it's a really wonderful segue. So, you know, you have all these observations coming in as an outsider in the 70s. How does that play out? Like reflecting back on it, how do you think that that played out in your early work, you know, depicting the city and coming in as an editorial cartoonist? Um, well, I mean, um, it was a, it was the start of a, a real transition and a change of Pittsburgh um, in terms of growth and in terms of there, 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 I heard this a lot. Well, we always have done that. We've always done it that way, and mm -hmm. and that started to change. I think, um, although uh, for a long time you wouldn't know it from the city council when we had Jeep and Michelle and and the, the county council and the and the the um, the um, the the profanatory prothonatory the uh, the Catherine Row offices and so on, uh, but you know it's just you have to you have to see what you have to notice the change and certainly everything changes and and of course the big the big change here was steel mm -hmm. leaving and going south literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I recall in some of our early conversations that pretty early on into the scene, you know, you, um, you took a focus on local government and some of the key characters who emerged. Would you mind just sharing with us, you know, as you saw it, um, you know, why was it such creative fodder for you, all these characters? Well, they were close up for one thing. And um, they were, a lot of these, uh, characters, if you want, or politicians or individuals were truly themselves. They were not, you know, they were not uh, um, uh, wash, and, wash and dry and they were, they said what they wanted and that made for, for great uh, TV and news and, and uh, certainly for, for cartoonists because they were not, you know, rubber stamped. I mean, they were individuals and, and, um, and, uh, and so, 
you didn't get a sense that it was this was sort of like Madison Avenue and they were they didn't have to they weren't rehearsing what they had to say they just said it and um and you know you, you appreciate that and, and and um they probably got mad at me for making fun of when they did that but um it was a it was theater in a way political theater uh and um and yet they were very sincere about it and and that's when michelle and jeep would get in arguments in city council because they're both both very um sincere and both uh, concerned about the city they just uh, they just came out a little bit differently <laughs> and they're all democrats that's the thing the whole city council democrats I mean, forget it. I mean, if, if you're a Republican, forget it. Move to the North Hills or South Hills or one of the hills, because it wasn't going to happen. And um, and that's why I, had, I drew the the good time, old time club Democrat because it was kind of where they'd all hang out, you know, in my mind. So, mm -hmm. so and, yeah. and and it was, they were more fun. I mean, look, you know, uh, you can draw brush nets. I mean, he had, had the commies over. Or she had the Russians, and they're always good for a laugh or two. But you know they have thirty thousand warheads aimed at us, and so I mean there are there are big issues. Of God, I mean, um, and the presidential and congressional issues, and the economy and all that. Uh, but you knew, as a cartoonist, or Peter Leo, my good friends, the columnist, came a year after I did. He knew too that people saw this stuff locally. I mean, they'd see it that day when it came out in the PG and. And that was kind of good to know that that somebody was looking at it. And uh, besides, I mean, the readers obviously, and thank thank goodness for them. Uh, but you, you know, uh, I don't think Brezhnev ever saw anything I drew, so that's all right with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, um, so it, yeah, I just and I figured that that a paper that the value of a cartoonist or a columnist to his or her newspaper is is staying local and then going or you know uh, criticizing or commenting on or praising the columnists can do that something that is local and right down the street you know mm -hmm. um cartoonists can't praise otherwise it turns out to be pr what you do is if you want to praise something you figure out who doesn't like it and then go after them and um i shouldn't say go after them criticize them that's a better word for it so. No, I think I think all that makes a lot of sense. And as we said, it's just such a powerful connection with like the work that we do at the History Center focusing on like Pittsburgh and and Western Pennsylvania history. So um, I you know I, I think I'll, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I really do. Um, and, you know, I kind of want to build off of that a little bit. So we mentioned, you know, just a, a couple of like local characters that were on the political scene that recurred a lot in your cartoons. Um, and, you know, one of the things that emerged to me was within those local fo focus cartoon is that I think like in an abstract sense, like you were really creating caricatures of the city of Pittsburgh over time um, and really portraits, like satirical portraits of our city and our region. And I just wondered like, you know, what do you make of that? Does that resonate with you? Like when you think back on your career and and think about like those local cartoons that you created um, that maybe weren't specifically focused on a specific political figure, but were very like entrenched in local stories. Well, it, you know, when you're, when you're working, you know, this is over 30 years or, or even or over a week or a month or a year, you're not doing, you're doing a series of them and they kind of evolve. I mean, they, 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 you, they build over and you, from time, to, over time, uh, you're building on one thing and then, and then it changes and you're doing another one. So over time, a, a, a kind of a portrait or a caricature, if you want to call it that, evolves. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's a um, you don't sit down and say, okay, uh, I'm going to do a portrait of Pittsburgh. Um, um, I mean, people have done it. I mean, better than I could. But I think, you know, I was saying about that because portraits and uh, Leslie said they're not they're not they are not photographs, uh, and a painter puts him or herself into it. And um, I thought, you know, uh, if I were going to do and I'd try to get resurrect an old steel mill somewhere and put it, move it into town and, and kind of go from there. Because, you know, Andrew Wyeth has gotten knocked around for just being doing photographic kind of paintings. But that famous scene of that one of Christina's world with the crippled woman in the, in the field, uh, the Olson Christina's farm up in Maine. I thought when I first saw it, it was in, 
in uh, Iowa somewhere because there are no trees, big old farmhouse and no trees, a big field. And uh, my wife and I and the kids were up there in the 80s and it was closed up then. But it was in Maine and they had fir trees all around it. But Wyatt took them out. He didn't want them. He wanted to look at this Christina who was in the field. And, um, and uh, so he, uh, you know, uh, painters, that's called artistic license. You know, if you want to move something, you move it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I would probably jigger stuff around and, and, and kind of figure out how I would do it with, uh, you know, you can't forget the steel mills, right? They, they built a city and, and built a country. And, and I, so the idea of a portrait, um, you know, cause I, well, I did caricature and they're the same things, right? Basically you're looking at somebody and, and kind of seeing what separate, what, how that person is just unique looking and, and, um, and, and you never sit, it never occurred to me to just do one kind of, this is it, I'm through with uh, the, this person because these, you know, life goes on and, and, um, and, and so they're around and they're, they're in power and that's what you do. You cartoonists, satirists are, uh, are, should be criticizing those in power, not, you should be hitting high, not low. No, um, and actually, you know, thinking about going after um, those in power, I wondered, you know, in thinking about like the figures who were on the scene locally, politically, who were some of your favorites to kind of, you know, poke and, and jab at and, and why is that it is? And if you could share a little bit about like what some of the back and forth looked like over the years, I think that would be super interesting. Yeah, uh, uh, well, um, I think that the city council was the thing that came up and well, Pete Flaherty was mayor then and I, I saw these signs around town state maintained road and I thought well the state must be pretty proud of those no Pete Flaherty put them up saying hey don't look at me the state these are state roads and so yeah you had Pete nobody's boy and then he ran as no you know ran much later as a, and as a with Tom Forrester uh, so he started with Pete and um, uh, and and the state legislature at the time was dominated by Democrats and Mayor Schaap was, uh, I mean, uh, Milton Schaap was governor. And, uh, and so they were, they were as ruthless as the, or as crazy as the Republicans. And, um, but locally, um, I mean, in city council, Jeep and Michelle couldn't stay away from each other. And they were, you know, and, and that's wonderful. I mean, let them fight, you know, it's like in hockey. And, um, and and Cyril Wecht was was um, of course um, I did one early on early on I didn't even know who he, he was and and uh, I did one uh, up in the with I, I guess Bob I mean uh, I can't remember who else was in it uh, um, but um, he was uh, quite a figure and um, and he sued me and he sued um, Tom Ritz who was a former columnist and he sued uh, the Post Gazette and um, and he, he, he wrote a couple of really humdingers of letters to me and to uh, several other people. And he, he, he was a, an amazing guy, very bright. I mean, he's a lawyer and a doctor and I couldn't even get, be, come close to being either one of those. But, and we had a rapprochement with the Duquesne Club, oh, the city, and, and of course the, the Steel City Club was, um, was, became the, uh, was, was the Duquesne Club. And uh, that's where the you know, shakers and makers were. And, and uh, they came out with, a, and it turns out all the cartoons I did of them, people bought them and, they, and they're all up in the Duquesne Club. And so, you know, what are you gonna do? And so they, 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 they the book that came out of the Steel City Club and they uh, asked, uh, they included one of Sophie, oh, Sophie Maslow and, and Cyril Acton. And Cyril said, yeah, he didn't have any problem with running one of them, but, could, but, but he'd like an invitation for himself and his wife and the Duquesne Club said, sure. And so I was waiting to meet him by the fountain in the Duquesne Club. I never met him. Actually, I met him once. I met him once, just briefly. I didn't actually, I was after a debate and uh, I went to shake his hand. And this is during the battle days when he really hated my guts. And, and so it was after a post debate and he came shaking hands. And I so I said, Dr. Wecht, I'm Tim. And he said, oh, Jesus Christ, pull on his hand like I'm talk, like I'm like COVID or something. And, and but, but at the Duquesne Club, was very gracious and and I you know he was being he got in trouble again and it was a Mary Beth Buchan or somebody who's had, had him was going after him and I told him at the time I said you know what uh, he uh, I, I I think that that's wrong and I I hope you 
I wish you the best on, on this. And so, you know, um, and, and the Post Gazette, the, the, the young photographer who was not, didn't know any of this, so had this history. And I said, well, Cyril Wex on his way. And she's all, oh. uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but, but we had a, a sort of rapprochement and, and, um, and, um, and that's great. You can, do this. I thought, you know, if this can happen, there can be peace all over the place. You know, we can shake hands and, and, uh, but, but he was something and me, of course, Sophie was, you know, I mean, there was no, I don't think there's ever been another city that's had so, a Sophie Massoff. And she would call the paper. She would call him. And from time to time, if I'd done something and she'd say, and I, I wouldn't be in that, but she'd say, is Tim there? And they would say, uh, no, may I ask who's calling? And no, that's okay, I'll call later. <laughs> and so when I get to work, uh, one of the people on the editorial page would say, um, the mayor called you. And you know, like as if they didn't know. And, 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 you know, so I called her up and she said, well, she said, I've just ruined your career. And I said, why is that, Madam Mayor? Well, I cut my hair. And I draw this big bouffant. And she said, she had her hair cut. I said, yeah, I know I saw that. I said, but why did you dye it orange? And she said, I, I hate that color. <laughs> so that was our conversation. And, you know, it, it was remarkable that she uh, was, uh, she, uh, she was very shrewd. You know, Bruce, she called Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Bed Spring and the Dreadful Dead. She was very shrewd. She was very shrewd. And she knew what she was doing. Very, she was a, a, a very astute politician and very sure of herself as a woman and as a, a politician. And so uh, any, nobody likes to be criticized, nobody. But she knows that that comes with the turf and nobody twisted her arm and, and said, we have to run for mayor. She did that on her own and nobody makes uh, a, a politician run for president or governor or anything. That's what they want to do. And, you know, um, as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. So, but she was wonderful and she was on the tonight show and and this and um she she knew that i mean she knew what she had and and she gave this city i think a real pizzazz and i said at this banquet at the duquesne club i said there should be a statue statue of sophie massoff outside uh, through, uh high, i mean the uh, uh, pnc park because yeah. uh, she was she came up with the idea we should have a, a new ballpark and of course some cartoonist i won't name me uh, when they said, oh, yeah, right. And so that, that was fodder. But she, you know, she was right. Mm -hmm. She was right. God. And actually, for those that aren't aware, Sam, um, with your work, would you mind just sharing a little bit how you often depicted Sophie within your cartoons that you, you talked about, you know, her dramatic haircut, but there were well, some other real features that, yeah, like other yeah, well, you it's, Yeah, you know, it's, it's she had a, a kind of a bouffant haircut, hair style. And um, so I, um, I kind of is it here again a cartoon. If you have big ears, uh, like I do, you make them bigger. Uh, big nose, you make them bigger. If she has a big hairdo, you make that bigger. Uh, and um, so one day, and I don't know, I can't remember. I think it was when she was running for re-election, and she was dodging the debate. She wasn't going to debate, and so I drew her, uh, um, and I thought, huh. How could she do that? Well, she's flying around. So it ended up, she ended up as Mayor Poppins. <laughs> so I drew Sophie with a little hat, little Mayor Mary Poppins hat and the umbrella going around. And that's, I think, how it happened. And I thought, well, you know, uh, cartoonists never give up anything. And, and I thought, okay, I could run that out for a while. And, and so um, <laughs> that's just the way it, it came out with the big you know, uh, the, so you have these props, and if you can get, find a, a something distinct about a person, and this was a little hat and an umbrella, and um, uh, and uh, and she, that's who she was to me. She became Mayor Poppins to me, and and it kind of, and so if you have a caricature, not only in, as how you look, but how you act and how the caricature sees that person, it's like a portrait artist. How do you see? How does that portrait artist see um, the subject? And um, the subject may not like it. And if you're, you know, Charles II of Spain uh, and he doesn't like it, well, then that's about the last portrait you're gonna do. But, um, um, so that's kind of how that went. And, and I, I put Jeep in a checkered suit. 
stuck with that. And, I don't and the know. cap that harkens to his time as an usher, I believe, at Forbes yeah, Field. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. the union, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the state stores, I mean, uh, you had to go in. The state stores were, if you're new to Pittsburgh, folks, you don't re remember the good old days when you had to ask for uh, a bottle of alcohol by um, number. And uh, so I had these people all lined up. And they became my, uh, my uh, LCB folks. Anyway, there you go. So I have appeared on screen again because we already have a wealth of questions okay. from the audience. So I thought I'd go ahead and start introducing a few of these into the conversation. Um, and I'll start at the top and we'll hopefully get through everybody's questions as part of your ongoing discussion. So first, um, someone has asked, would you share thoughts about the esteemed caricaturist John Johns and the editorial work of the Pittsburgh Press? Did your work ever kind of intersect professionally with them? Um, not really. I, I met John several, John John several times uh, when we were doing, I was a judge, several of us were, I think Rob Rogers was too, and uh, for the Associated, I mean, the um, Allegheny Association of Retarded Citizens, and they had an annual uh, art contest, and then we would judge, and then it'd be a, a dinner, and John Johns would do caricatures of the artists. And I and he also would do at, at during the Three Rivers Arts Festival he uh, would, uh, would draw and so and so we got to know each other a bit and he was a wonderful caricaturist I mean I he he is he, he is uh, he he really has a knack for doing it not only doing a caricature but doing it fast and I can't do that but I, I was I'm a I was a big admirer of John Johns as I should point out uh, Jack Davis who you saw with drawing the. Uh -huh. Names every all of us kids, all of us kids read Mad Magazine, and all one there were three people. Well, no, two people: J Jack Davis, well, Mort Drucker, and then Don Martin, uh, who was a, got a big floppy feet, and they'd flop over the sidewalk, and his goofy guys. And and um, a lot of cartoonists say, well, they were influenced by Charles Schultz, but and, and Schultz was a, a giant. But I think a lot of us are influenced by Don Martin, and and but yeah, John Johns was a it was a terrific. Okay, and then the next question, I'm going to combine two. One of them is, can you talk about the difference between humor and satire in your medium? And then is there a subject, is there someone or something you satirize that in hindsight you wish you hadn't? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I, you can draw humorous, you can be funny in a drawing, and, and if you're satirizing something, you're, you're basically making fun of it. Um, and you're making fun of a person or um, a city or a, a, an aspect of a city. It is, uh, satirists do that in writing too. Um, and, um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a point to the whole thing. There's a little bit of a zinger to it. You can be funny, and I'm doing, I do a lot of cartoons now for uh, Pittsburgh Quarterly, and they're, and they're more of the sort of a gag cartoon kind of thing, uh, non-political. Non and uh, you can be funny about things, taking an issue, whatever it is, without having a zinger, without saying, oh yeah, this is really stupid, so, or, you're, or I'm or, or oppressive, or the wrong thing to do. You can just say, well, here it is, and kind of have fun with it. There, there's a difference. A satire usually has a, a point, a criticism to it. Following up on those, did you satirize? Did you satirize any national figures? Oh well? sure, yeah, uh, everybody. I mean, yeah, we all. I did uh, the presidents, yeah, the national congress, and and so on. Um, but uh, I think it, I think probably it was about 50, 50 overall uh, national, and I did five a week, and uh, uh, mostly, and and uh, I guess. It, it was a, a balance, uh, but you, you, what you do is you, you have to wait till there's a news peg, you, the, the hated or the dreadful or the famous news peg. Why am I doing a cartoon about a, whatever the president was, the, the, the mayor or the, or the governor or you know, whoever it is? What, what has that person done that kicks us in gear? And, uh, and the other question that the, was asked was, have I ever satirized somebody I wish I hadn't? Um, no, not really. Um, uh, I, you know, there are a couple of times I drew people that were, was taken the wrong way. 
Uh, and um, but I I don't think so. And one of the things is. Um, a friend of mine used to cartoonist from Seattle said, I, I draw them, I don't publish them. So, I mean, uh, I, I draw something and, and, and generally 99% of the time the paper said, fine, I just put it in. But every now and then John Craig, the editor or Bill Block might call, but and actually Bill, I don't think he ever pulled the plug on anything, but, but um, you know, if, if it's, if you're, out, if you're over the edge and cartoonists, you try not to edit yourself. You just plow ahead, and and that's and then the editor might say, eh, I don't, you know, we got it now. I don't think so." Uh, and and so I think a couple of times, I've been saved from myself. And since this one also connects to what we're talking about, do you think that your cartoons had an effect on the behavior of the people that you featured and drew? Do you think it ever changed anyone's behavior? No, I don't think so. Um, I I don't think so. I think people. Who are satirized or caricatured see it, uh, and, and yet that the people to whom I drew uh, were acting just as they would normally, and they I think knew that that's going to come. Every sometimes some people have thinner skin, I guess, than others. I don't think anybody changed. They might dig in if nothing else. I don't know. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, and I don't think cartoonist the, gone are the days uh, when Thomas Nast ruled the roost you know because there's no TV and and all that but uh, you know um, it, it might change it might make people think what you're trying to do is connect with readers and 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 read some readers are gonna love it and some are gonna hate what you're doing you know as part of the chemistry and talking about loving and hating things someone would like to know how you would describe the bike lane issue in Pittsburgh I um, well, I think it's uh, it's a, it's a, everything changes, and I I I was shocked when they started putting bike lanes in because I thought if no if any city is not going to have bike lanes, it's going to be Pittsburgh. But again, this is where we are now. I mean, Pittsburgh's changing, and um, and uh, you drive around and, and you realize that they, they are doing what other cities have done long before, and I think it's good. I think you know because I. You know, friends that bike to work and and um i'm okay with that and and um you know it's i think they're probably safer in a bike lane than a pedestrian is in the crosswalk and i tell people who visit here look i get it in seattle i get it you're in a crosswalk people stop don't think it's going to happen here just don't and i i tell you when the paper is down on that boulevard of the allies i i a crossing I was safer. I'd walk across, jaywalk right in the middle of the street, and people stop. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm like, oh, stop. Go ahead. And if you're in a crosswalk, though, it's look out. <laughs> I'm okay with the bike lanes. So yeah. someone, you have your answer on the bike lanes. And but I, but I would, uh, but but that doesn't mean I wouldn't make fun of them if I had, um, you know, eighteen thousand bikes and, and one guy with a car trying to get through. You know. And here's another one. Um, are there any current local political characters who you feel could compete as cartoon subjects with Sophie or Jeep? You mean today? Today. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. That's a boy. Um, I, I'll have to think about that. I, I don't know. Bill Peduto has his moments. Has his moments. Um, I'll, I'll think of something. You know, they the were one person... a different era, you know, it was a different era then. And it's grown, Pittsburgh's gotten a little more buttoned down. And, um, you know, there are, uh, I'll, I'm probably, I'm probably, there's a couple right in front of me I'm, I'm missing. I'm sorry, I'll turn the thing up. And do you, it, it's interesting to hear you say that because there are very distinctive eras in any place. Do you miss some of those old characters? As you, you as an artist, I mean, you develop your own sort of relationship with them. Do you miss some of those people? Yes. Subjects. Yes. Yeah. It's it's very bland now. It's very bland. Um, and I uh, took to, to me, um, and um, uh, you know, even the the state government when I got here, half of them were going to jail or just getting out of jail, and it seemed like it seemed like Democrats. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I I don't miss. You know, I don't miss that era. I, I I'm glad where we are now. I'm glad Pittsburgh's where it is. But 
you know, just for from a selfish standpoint, uh, sure, you'd always want to. But there are about six people you'd always, mm -hmm. you'd always want. Um, you know. So I have one friend who says that they miss your wit and they want to know where you live now. I live in my own little world. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking down on the list. I live. I live. I, I haven't moved. I, I moved. I live in the same place that where we moved into which how's that for grammar we moved in 1976 so, there you are soul of consistency when it comes to your neighborhood yeah <laughs> um and here's a good one um, an, an attendee has said thank you for your consistently penetrating and insightful cartoons and the question how do you maintain your comic perspective when covering charged and often dark moments and situations and i think that's a really especially good question right now how do you keep your perspective and still find the humor in things uh because the best way to approach um let's say let's, let's take a president i could name and i won't the best way is just use as much humor as you got uh you can't you you know um Dark, some dark situations are, are just dark. Flight 427, uh, you know, 9-11, there's, um, but there are situations with, in poli let's say take politics, uh, where humor shows the best way, is the humor shows the folly of, of that person or that group. Uh, the militias are ripe for, you know, these crazy militias. I mean, there, I, I, I came across one that I did 15, 20 years ago uh, on a militia, one of those call and response, you know, I don't know, but I've been told, you know, military stuff and this crazy militia stuff. You, the, the, I think if it's really that type of dark humor, that situation, then it calls for humor. And, and, and the best way to do that is just go after them and, and make them look as dumb as you can. And I think we have garnered all of the Q&A questions. I see one comment in the chat for whoever is talking about the Joe Namath versus Joe Montana. If I said Joe Montana, that was a mistake because it is Joe Namath and the, the work is identified as Joe Namath. So if I said Joe Montana, that was my personal error. It is Joe Namath. Um, and that's a great, you know, uh, Tim, you mentioned Jack Davis, you know, there's a case where the family, we had to go back and clear that image. And I don't even think the family had a sense that the rights and the issues regarding what Jack Davis did and the, the issues with Mad Magazine, they had never really sorted those things out. Um, but gosh, I loved Mad as a kid. Were there other kinds of magazines or besides the artists for Mad, were there others who you looked to as examples as you were growing up, people whose work you really enjoyed? Yeah, um, 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 no, who was I going to say? Well, uh, locally, I'm or, or, um, American cartoonists. Uh, of course, everybody's reading Con Paul Conrad and, and and Bill Malden, and then Pat Oliphant came over from Australia in 1964 and and totally changed totally changed the look of American cartooning. Before it was vertical, and now it's, it became that horizontal format. And he brought this punch magazine stick out your tongue approach uh before the cartoonists were very serious we've got to get to work and don't know all fan came over and just blew it out of the water and he is two two cartoonists he is the god of cartooning and all fan is you know he's wonderful and he and everybody started drawing like him including moi <laughs> yeah, here's another every, good here's and and, and and but there are other but i tell kids when they come in don't look who's popular now. And this my friend Ray Collins out of Seattle, a wonderful cartoonist, told me years ago when I was wanting to get a, still trying to figure out how to, what to draw. He said, don't, don't be influenced by who's popular now. Go back and look who influenced that person. And so, you know, you, you look back and some of these great English cartoonists and things and just poke around. There's one, there's one art all over the place. And here's a good, since we're heading towards the eight o'clock witching hour, here's a good question that might be a, a, an effective wrap up. What will happen to cartoonists if newspapers continue to disappear? And do you have any sense of what is the medium of the future for cartoons? 
Um, I, I think at one point I used to say, I'd, I'd tell young people, don't go into newspapers, find a magazine or go into TV or broadcast uh, online. I don't know how they're gonna make a living. I think that will sort out, I, you know, every, everything evolves and, and, and so online papers or magazines will figure out how to get money. There's gonna be a market somewhere animation uh the, you know the, um you don't go where we were i mean it's all changed in the cripe and since i was here got here in 76 look where we are now and um and it's there are there are, are shrinking the new york times used to run stuff on sunday they don't run anything anymore cartoons so uh animation uh online um do you know they'll be like entrepreneurs i think um starting their own whatever, little broad seats or, um, you know, uh, that are, they're always, there always have been entrepreneurs. And I think uh, young cartoonists will figure out how to, where to, where to, how to do their stuff and where to put it. And so Sierra and Tim, do you have any final thoughts for this evening that you'd like to add to the conversation? Sierra? So actually I do. Um, so my introduction to doing some background research on Tim was just using our online subscription to the Post-Gazette's archives. I have to say it's a wonderful way to look into the work of an editorial cartoonist because you get all the hits for his names and all the letters to the editors. And one of my favorites um, was written by Fred of Mount Lebanon in 1980, so pretty early on in your career. And he writes, I often wonder how Pittsburgh can attract and keep a political cartoonist with the talent and national potential of Tim and Ease. And then I remember this is the city of champions. And of course, that's written in 1980. Um, <laughs> lovely golden time for Pittsburgh in sports. And I just, um, you know, after reviewing your whole collection, um, his remarks really resonate with me. It's just been such an honor to get to know you better, Tim, to get to know your work and to know that um, for generations to come, we will be the place where researchers can learn more about our region's history through the lens of your incredible vantage point as an artist. Well, I consider myself a, a, a newcomer, a, a Pittsburgher. Uh, our daughter was born here, uh, you know, um, but I'm so, I have been so lucky to have been living in Pittsburgh for the past, you know, since 40 years, you know, um, or so, um, you know, and, and being able to draw here and live here. It's a wonderful area. And a wonderful city, and this and the Pittsburghers. I must say, the readers over the years have been very uh, not kind, but understanding. I mean, they've been under they they get it, and and um, uh, they 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 may not like it or they may like it, but um, I've been I, I've I've had a good time here, and I've I've, been, I've really appreciated being part of this city. And I see I have one more question here that has sneaked in under the line. Did you ever meet or work with Cy Hungerford or was he gone? Yes. I think you, we talked yes. about that. No, I did. Absolutely. I came and Bill Block interviewed me, uh, the publisher in California, had a paper out there. And, and, uh, and, he, and he wrote and he said, you know, Cy Hungerford, I'm, he, he said, uh, I like, I'm going to be bringing on a new cartoonist, but I'm not going to put him out to pasture. It would kill him. He's been here. He's been part of this paper. I'm not going to I'm not going to kick him out. He, he retired when he was 89. I'm not going to kick him out. And I thought, if this is, you know, if this is the type of person we that the Post Gazette has owning it and running the paper, I'm 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 count me in. If if he and he, if he hires me and he did, I thought that was a wonderful thing. Sure, I wanted to get going, but I also appreciated how Bill treated his people. I it is absolutely crucial. What a, a gentleman he was. And, and, and I, I came here, I didn't, I interviewed in California. I didn't come here until, you know, I was hired, but I figured it's going to be okay. He's the publisher. He owns it. It's going it, to, we're going to be fine. Well, thank you to you both for this evening's great conversation. And thank you to our audience for all the wonderful questions. So was such a pleasure. I am so glad we were able to connect schedules and get this one on the calendar. Um, okay. For those, ben, sorry, ben Roethlisberger would be my, uh, the new guy that would compete. I think uh, he's quite a guy. <laughs> and and uh, I'll go with that. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Any final, I'll give, the pen, I'll give our audience one final call if anybody has any final questions. 
Um, I'll tell you, if you have enjoyed some of the other programming related to portraits, we have one more program connected with this ex exhibition and it is next Thursday evening. It is, and I'm gonna read it here because it's a longer title. It's Power, Legacy, and the Future of Portraiture. It's a panel discussion with Don Bream, who's the curator of decorative arts at the Frick, looking at their collection. I will be a part of that. And we also have Charlotte Ickes, who is the curator of time-based media at the National Portrait Gallery. And if you want to know what time-based media is, you will have to just check in next week for that program. But we are so thankful for you all to be here tonight. And thank you again, Tim. This was just a wonderful program. Thank you for doing it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you all. Good night.